So what we're proposing through the hemp exemption is still to require farmers to get that license or permit to grow so that our law enforcement and our departments of agriculture know where the crop is going. But when they're actually getting that license, they would now have the option to make a designation or a declaration that they are only growing for grain and fiber. And if they select that and make the declaration, yes, I am only growing grain and fiber, they would no longer have to have a background check. They would still be required to have a visual inspection of their crop. And as long as that visual inspection verified that, yes, they are only growing for grain and fiber, that they would no longer have to go through that sampling and testing requirement that floral producers or cannabinoid hemp producers would, would have to and are currently going through. That's Courtney Moran from Agricultural Hemp Solutions. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Harlock, and today we will talk to Courtney and her colleagues Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association and Morgan Elliott Tweet from IND Hemp. Together, they have been working on creating an exemption for hemp fiber and grain growers that will exempt these farmers from some of the stringent and expensive testing requirements currently required under the U.S. hemp program. So stay tuned for that. We're going to take a quick sponsor break and then come back with some nuggets of hemp news. This episode is brought to you in part by iHemp Michigan. Join us at the 2022 Midwest iHemp Expo as we talk about the power of hemp. On May 20th and 21st, iHemp Michigan is host to the Midwest's largest cannabis trade show. With over 30 breakout education sessions, both business-to-business and consumer-focused education, the show will be packed with opportunities to network and learn. Visit iHempMichigan.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you in part by IND Hemp in Fort Benton, Montana, where their mission is to provide innovative agricultural products and services to connect American farmers with the pioneers and businesses that see hemp as a way to bring real and lasting change to our communities and planet. IND Hemp. Okay, welcome back. So last week I skipped over the news nuggets because I had a cold and I couldn't talk real well. But we got some good headlines for you here today, uh, this third week of April 2022. All right, this first one comes from sourcingjournal.com and it says that Cone Denim has debuted U.S. Hemp Denim with Bastcore. Cone Denim's latest collaboration touts the benefits of U.S. agriculture, the story says. The Denim Mill worked with hemp processing company Bastcore on a first-to-market collection of 3 by one and comfort-stretch fabrics made with Alabama-grown hemp and U.S. cotton and dyed with natural indigo grown in Tennessee. This marks Bascor's first mill partnership to date. The Alabama company developed a process for producing clean, mechanically processed Oikotech Standard 100 certified and USDA bio-preferred hemp fiber. It signed the first U.S. hemp fiber supply contract in 2017, enabling it to process domestically grown textile grade hemp fiber for California-based retailer Recreator Hemp Apparel. All right, here's a story from Pennsylvania. This is in the morning call, and it says that 40,000 people are expected to attend the Pennsylvania Cannabis Festival in Kutztown this weekend. The PA Cannabis Festival, whose goal is to raise awareness to end cannabis prohibition in the Keystone State, returns this weekend to Renninger's Farmer's Market in Kutztown. Ashley Salento of Zik Productions, who puts on the annual event, said that New Jersey legalizing cannabis only helps us at the Pennsylvania Cannabis Festival. The only thing hurting us in Pennsylvania, she says, is the politicians. All right, this next story comes from FurnitureNews.net. The story says that fifth generation family bed maker Harrison Spinks has confirmed its expansion into new North Yorkshire farmland to support its growth and sustainability plans, which will increase the company's hemp production. 
The new rather-based farmland spans 80 acres and will be used to increase the company's production of industrial hemp. The increase in hemp production will see the company producing in excess of a thousand tons of hemp straw annually, making Harrison Spinks the largest grower of industrial hemp in the UK. Hemp fiber, a key component of the company's mattresses, is one of the strongest natural fibers. It is used in Harrison Spinks' fillings and is known for its fresh and absorbent properties. Okay, this next story is on PHL 17. The headline reads, PA's first home made out of hempcrete to be unveiled Friday. Friday at 2 p.m., PA Department of Agriculture Fred Strathmeyer and Policy Director Mike Roth will unveil Project PA Hemp Home, Pennsylvania's first complete renovation of a blighted home using hemp-based building materials. The home is located in the 500 block of Spruce Street in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Hemp wood flooring was also used in the house, produced by hemp grown in Lawrence County in Don Service's Hemp Test Acres program. The program supports farmers to learn to grow industrial hemp. The house was constructed by Don Enterprises. Funding was provided in part by the PA Department of Agriculture. All right, so listeners of this show know that I've been there. I went there uh, last summer. It was a very last stop on our national hemp tour. So anyway, it's exciting to see that this house is finally done. They are having a ribbon cutting uh, tomorrow, Friday the 22nd, but I am not able to attend that, unfortunately. Um, but we will be doing some follow-up reporting uh, with the folks at Dawn Services, and maybe we'll even talk to the family that moves into the house. So anyway, congratulations to the folks at Dawn Services and uh, everybody involved in this amazing project. All right, so that wraps it up for the news nuggets for this week. I'll have links to all of these stories and more on the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. Oh, hey, and also don't forget, it's the Pennsylvania Hemp Summit next week, April 26th and 27th. You can learn more about that at PAHempSummit.com. And I will be there, so if you're there, please say hi. And now we're going to talk exemption with Courtney, Erica, and Morgan. Here we go. Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association, Courtney Moran from Agricultural Hemp Solutions, and Morgan Elliott Tweet from IND Hemp and the Hemp Feed Coalition. Welcome back to our podcast. It's an honor to have you all here at once today. How are you doing? We're good. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, so I wonder if we could go around the room and just each give a, a quick introduction. Um, start with Morgan. Yeah, thanks. So your listeners may remember me. My name is Morgan Tweet. I'm with IND Hemp up in Fort Benton, Montana, and I'm also the executive director of the Hemp Feed Coalition. So we are a grain and fiber processor working with a local network of farmers and um, creating food feed and fiber products. Excellent. Erica? Uh, hi, my name is Erica Stark. I'm the executive director of the National Hemp Association. I've been in this role going on I guess this is five years now. In July, it'll be five years. Um, so working on all things hemp and uh, super excited and honored to be working with these wonderful women um, and furthering a great cause that I know we'll get to in just a minute. So thanks for having us. Yep. And Courtney. Yes. Hi, I'm Courtney Moran. I am the chief legislative strategist with Agricultural Hemp Solutions. We are a hemp focused government relations firm. We've worked on policy throughout the country in numerous states. Uh, we coordinated with IND Hemp last year in Montana, actually passing feed legislation for including hemp as an ingredient in animal feed and worked very closely with uh, Senator McConnell and Senator Wyden's office in drafting the Hemp Farming Act of 2018, the language included in the 2018 Farm Bill. So we're very excited to have this team put together to work on policy, potentially as a standalone, but, um, you know, for the upcoming 2023 Farm Bill. Okay. Yeah, this is quite a group here. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, so the three of you recently penned an op-ed for Lancaster Farming's Industrial Hemp Special Section, and the title of that was Why We Need an Industrial Hemp Exemption. So... Let's talk about that. Well, maybe first, if someone could briefly explain what the problem is that we would even need an exemption for. Uh, Morgan, you want to take that? Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so as probably most of your listeners know, you know, the industrial hemp um, production and different crop opportunities are pretty different. And right now, the Farm Bill only gives um, a narrow window of how it's managed state by state. 
and um, under USDA and tribal law. So what has happened is basically there's this huge gap between um, grain and fiber production and floral hemp production for cannabinoids, but they're all managed the same way. And so what we've seen here on the ground in Montana is we we're, we're just have another hurdle to cross with our farmers that they're held to these really stringent requirements um, you know, starting with the application process, the fees, and then ending with the testing and sampling procedure that's really making it challenging to grow this crop and grow our network of, of producers. And so, you know, specifically, you know, grain and fiber genetics, especially grain has his, historically shown not to be a compliant issue. And fiber, similarly, you know, we don't harvest any of the floral material. And so, although the genetics may not be as stable in terms of compliance, what I always go back to is, you know, neither of those production models have a harvestable flower material coming off of the crop. So um, we're really, you know, we started putting our heads together. I'm, I'm really fortunate to have such great friends like Erica and Courtney here that are putting our heads together of what is the big problem and how can we address it so that there's a, a distinction between grain and fiber production and floral production that opens up uh, more pathways for both types of producers. So. Although this is a grain and fiber exemption, you know, there is a carve out that allows floral production to still be productive and um, you know, economical and allows those, those producers and, um, and consumer products to continue to grow. But grain and fiber are more like typical commodity crops. And so we're really trying to push for federal language to manage them similar to you know, existing commodity crops. And I think that that is really necessary if we're going to see either of those crops, you know, take off and, and be what we all want them to be um, and see the acreage put in that we need to see. So. Okay, so farmers have to pay for a permit, right? And then they have to get their their hemp tested every so often to make sure it's got below 0.03% THC. And then there's the chance that their their crop might have to be destroyed if it is higher than that. So it seems pretty risky and maybe like a typical farmer might not want to take that risk. Um, well, what's the permit fee for corn and soy and how much testing do they have to do on the corn and soy side of things? Yeah, that's a great example. You know, it's pretty much non-existent, right? Most, most crops that these guys are planting don't have an application process, don't have a permit fee. And so, you know, especially this year, which is such a competitive and challenging commodity market with the crazy swings in the commodity pricing, you know, I'm just this lonely hemp farmer and producer and trying to get contracts and I have everything going against me. And then when I finally get the guy to say, okay, yeah, I'll consider growing hemp for you. And then I say, okay, great. I need a thousand dollars up front going to the state department and they're going to come on your field and they're going to sample and you might have to destroy your crop. Right. Do you see how, how that doesn't work for me? Um, and so, you know, it's definitely like we have to talk the language that these these farmers already know. We have to make sure that the barriers to entry, you know, are achievable. And um, and at the end of the day, like if we're worried about compliance and we're worried about products that could potentially, you know, have psychoactive effects or considered to be you know potentially drugs, Right, then let's look at those products. We don't necessarily have to push that all the way down to the farmer and let him manage that because um, he's having a hard enough time as it is just competing with the commodity markets. Right. So I think you've identified the problem pretty well. So is the solution then would be an exemption at the federal level so farmers wouldn't have to go through th those hoops? Courtney, do you want to talk about what this exemption would look like? Sure. So right now under the, you know, under 2018 farm bill, everyone is required, everyone that's growing hemp is required to get a license. And then they're required to, depending upon their state or tribal plan or the USDA plan, have an inspection and have that crop tested. So, and also go through a background check. So what we're proposing through the hemp exemption is still to require farmers to get that license or permit to grow so that our law enforcement and our departments of agriculture know where the crop is going. But when they're actually getting that license, they would now have the option to make a designation or a declaration that they are only growing for grain and fiber. And if they select that and make the declaration, yes, I'm only growing grain and fiber, they would no longer have to have a background check they would still be required to have a visual inspection of their crop 
And as long as that visual inspection verified that, yes, they are only growing four grain and fiber, that they would no longer have to go through that sampling and testing requirement that floral producers or cannabinoid hemp producers would, would have to and are currently going through. And so that way, our, you know, our grain and fiber farmers are, they're still being uh, you know, tracked in a sense so that law enforcement knows who's growing what, where, right? We're not, we're not to full cannabis legalization yet. And so there's still a lot of concern from the law enforcement side, but that we're treating our grain and fiber farmers as close to traditional farmers as we can today. Okay. So that seems like it would take the burden not only off of the farmer, but also take the burden off of law enforcement and, you know, departments of agriculture and sort of make the whole thing a little easier for everybody. All right. Exactly. And hopefully reduce costs, not only for the farmer, but also reduce costs for our administrators. Which would reduce costs for taxpayers. Right. And right. the whole supply chain. Right. <laughs> Erica. Yeah. And, you know, and I think it's also really important to, to emphasize over and over again that what we're proposing here is not novel. It's not new. It's not controversial. These products being the stock and the seed have always been exempted, even from the definition of marijuana. So even under the, the existing USDA final rule, your remediation option, if your crop is a little bit hot, is to just sell the stock and the grain. So there really is no reason to go through all this excessive testing for compliance when at the end of the day, you're only selling those products that are definitely compliant anyway, because that's what you're allowed to do if you have a crop that exceeds it, you know, um, with the remediation. So it's it shouldn't be controversial at all. And the other other reason that it is necessary when we start talking about like larger producers, like where we need to go if we want to have reliable, stable supply chains that can service all of the various industries that are interested in using, you know, hemp fiber, you know, either bast or herd for for, you know, anything is that if you have a stream running through your field, that's considered another plot. If you have a roadway that divides your field, that's considered another plot. So it's not even like if you have, you know, it's only you have to have compliance testing now for each plot and any disruption in it being a contiguous field designates it as an additional plot. So those costs can add up relatively quickly unless you just happen to be in a scenario where you just have one field that's not broken up by anything. Um, so we're we're really excited to, to see this happen. Um, I think as as Morgan you know had said is like when when we took the industrial out of the definition of hemp, we lost a very important distinction between these crops. And these crops are very easily differentiated visually just by looking at the style of cultivation that that's happening. Um, so we're really excited to see this move forward and and open up this industry for, to our a lot more traditional farmers. Okay, you said it shouldn't be controversial, but I assume that at, somebody finds this controversial, or you know, sort of, is there any pushback that you're receiving? Or, you know, how do you get this exemption through? Well, so I, I want to highlight something that Erica said, and then I'll answer your question, Eric. So so Erica pointed out that historically in the definition of marijuana, dating all the way back to 1937, these parts of the plant have always been exempted. They've never been considered part of the definition of marijuana. But the issue historically has always been the cultivation and then the requirements that were were put in place under the Controlled Substances Act with the registrations with the DEA. And so through the 2014 Farm Bill, we authorized pilot programs and research. And under the 2018 Farm Bill, we authorized commercial cultivation. But even with those authorizations, that exemption under the definition of marijuana for grain and fiber as the product was always there. But the but Historically, if we look at how the, the definitions and the policies evolved, a lot of it is fear-based, right? It's fear over THC. And so if, these, if the products themselves have always been exempted and now we allow cultivation, we should really be looking at our farmers and why are we penalizing farmers that are trying to grow the crops that are producing the products that have always been exempted. 
And so I just I just think that historical context is really important in understanding why this isn't a novel concept. And, and the other piece that Erica pointed out is, you know, the remediation piece that's provided for in the USDA final rules, but also the performance-based sampling. So this is really kind of just providing a larger context for performance-based sampling because performance-based sampling is optional right now under a state and tribe or tribal plan. But if we get the hemp exemption, this will be a model that all states and tribes can elect to, to implement in their jurisdictions for their grain and fiber farmers. And so it should be a lot easier for grain and fiber farmers to actually get into the industry. Can you explain so what you mean by performance-based sampling? Yeah, so performance-based sampling is a portion of the USA final rules, and it allows a state or a tribal government to develop a protocol where they're only going to do certain inspections and sampling and testing of crops. So Montana is the perfect example. So Montana has a category system for how they actually go out and do the inspections and the sampling. So if you plant a category A cultivar, then you only have 10% of the crops are getting tested and inspected. If you are a category B cultivar, 20% of the crops are getting tested and inspection. If it's a category C, 100% of those crops are getting tested. And it's based on historical uh, information coming back from the different cultivars. Are they going to be compliant or not? And that's, that's really what that's looking to. But this hemp exemption goes a step farther. Okay. And it's also important to realize that currently the USDA has not implemented performance-based testing in their own programs for the states that don't have a program that are operating under USDA rules. So those people that, you know, like Wisconsin and other states that USDA manages their program don't have the option for performance-based testing yet anyway. Okay. Um, and Morgan, in Montana, that, that system seems to be working for farmers? Yeah, it's great because we, we know going into a season, what is our level of risk? And, you know, farming is a very risky business. And so if a farmer has one more variable that they can cross off the list of, you know, um, potential, you know, failure to, to meet compliance standards or whatnot, then that just gives them that level of security. They can go into the season already knowing. And at the end of the day, that's less cost to our Department of Ag. And that's probably the biggest victory of performance-based sampling is if you know this genetics time and time and time again, never test positive or higher than 0.3%, why are we testing it? Why are we going and spending the taxpayers' dollars and, and those fees that are associated with it to put somebody out on the road and get them to test it? Just doesn't make sense, you know? So it's a very logical, you know, logically driven program. Um, but I will answer your question, like, you know, this isn't controversial potentially, you know, it, it's pretty easy, right? People, their initial reaction will say, well, how do you know they're not growing pot, right? It's still like the same argument that we're seeing is like, someone for sure is gonna grow marijuana in there. And if you don't test it, by golly, like there's gonna be weed out there. And so it's like, you know, a little bit of a fear mongering and, and we appreciate that there is a risk, but like there's a level of risk for everything. Like if there's any policy, you know, not just hemp related, but in general, any policy that has 100% you know, no risk that there could be bad actors or whatnot, like show me it, right? Like there's always gonna be something that could potentially go wrong. Right, so if you are if you wanted to grow pot, you would probably just grow some pot rather than like sneak it into some, like your big farming operation. Like why would you jeopardize your whole livelihood for that? Exactly, and that's, you know, what we have go back to is like we have really strict protocols for like that designation, right? Like you're declaring to the government that you are growing grain and fiber. If you declare to the government that you're doing this and you do something intentionally different, then there's a really like strong penalty against that. And, and I think that that is hopefully the biggest deterrent that like we take this very seriously. If you go out and you plant a variety and you're going to harvest the seed and you have the genetics to do that. And then halfway through this season, you said, well, hey, I think I'm gonna go harvest flower material. Like that's, you, you can't do that, right? And, and quite frankly, that like, that's not what's happening on the cultivation practice anyway. We have very low um, levels of cannabinoids, you know, low value of return um, and just the harvesting practices, they aren't well developed. And so if anyone's like intentionally trying to, you know, pull the wool over the government's eyes and they think that they're gonna go harvest high cannabinoid flour or high THC flour material in a grain or fiber, you know, variety, they've got another thing coming for them. And like, that's a failure just waiting to happen anyways. 
Yeah, so I, I would echo what Morgan is saying. And that is like the risk, right? The fear is that someone's going to try to make this designation and then grow marijuana in the field. But when I, when a couple of things I want to point out is that the existing framework under the 2018 Farm Bill for cannabinoid or non-exempted production will be maintained. And so it's only folks that know I am only growing grain and fiber that would make this declaration and get this designation for the exemption. Anyone that wants to grow floral hemp, any hemp for cannabinoids or anything like that would be under the existing framework with the licensing, the inspections, the testing, what have you. And so when we are looking at, you know, a visual inspection of the crops, I mean, we've gone out to field, we actually have a video on our website, hempexemption.com, that shows the different types of production practices, what the crops actually look like in the field. And these crops look very different, right? If you're growing only cannabinoid hemp, floral hemp, it does look very similar to marijuana. And we have had issues in Oregon, you know, it's, it's right here uh, happening. And we've been working with our local law enforcement on this because there have been folks growing marijuana in the cannabinoid field. But we just don't foresee that happening with the grain and fiber production. And if somebody were to be a bad actor and to try to do that, the penalty is getting kicked out of the program, right? Because you would have made a false statement on your application and making this declaration that's already in the existing 2018 Farm Bill uh, authority that if you make a false statement on your application that you're kicked out of the program and that's what would be maintained. And so this designation is really only for a farmer that knows I am only growing for grain and fiber or grain or fiber, right? This is the only thing that I'm going to do. I have no interest in selling any sort of floral material. I have no interest in doing any sort of extraction for resins or cannabinoids on my material that I'm growing. And so anyone that does want to do that, they just stay in the existing program that we have. This okay, is why we're creating this exemption for grain and fiber. And as Erica was saying, to really help us scale that side of the industry. Well, I think it sounds like a good idea and it's going to help a lot of people. Um, but obviously I have no, you know, pull or sway in the government. So what do you do? You, you call up Mitch McConnell and you, you set up like a, a, a golfing outing with them or what do you, how does it work? What do you do? Well, currently we, we do have uh, both a Republican and a Democratic um, potential champions for these bills. We're not at liberty to release their names just yet because they're in the process of what they're calling running the traps, which is basically going through all of their different colleagues, different agencies, um, you know, ag committees, you know, you name it, and, and making sure that there is no resistance. And I think we're really, really, really close. Um, I know we have one for sure. Um, and the other one is, you know, probably a week or so away from pulling the, the, the trigger on their commitment. Um, so we'll be excited to come back and give you that update when that happens. Um, but there is a whole process and protocol that legislators go through when they're getting ready to introduce bills um, to make sure that they have a, a clear playing field and have significant buy-in um, from their peers. And from everything you know that we've seen so far, um, it's going relatively well. Good. And you're expecting this to be standalone legislation or this would get wrapped up into the next farm bill? How would that work? Maybe both. Um, the, the, we, we intend to have it introduced as a standalone bill. And if we can get it to move and pass quickly, fantastic. If not, we'll have the, the, the verbiage and the language already fleshed out and vetted amongst a bunch of people. And then the, getting it into the, the next farm bill would be plan B. Okay. So I understand why farmers should be interested in this and, you know, policymakers and um, hemp people in general, but why would maybe the general public be concerned about this? Well, I'll speak for the manufacturer real quick and Courtney, maybe you can speak to the consumer. Um, from a pr processor and manufacturer's perspective, you know, we need to be able to compete with well-known commodities and products that have the, the, um, the, the history of, you know, special hybrid seed genetics, you know, a very specialized processing equipment. And right now, like the bottleneck of pretty much everything uh, cannabis related right now is THC. And so if I pull that, that variable out for just a second and I start looking at, you know, breeding genetics to have like higher oleic, you know, um, omegas in it or something, or breeding genetics 
for higher production of fiber yields. And I start focusing on what the consumer needs and what the manufacturer needs. Now my breeding program, it looks much different, right? Now that I have the diversity of like multiple different things impacting my bottom dollar line instead of this bottleneck that's stuck on THC. And so, you know, we're a pretty immature industry at large. And so that, and that just, to me, is just continuing to hold us down and, and is the ceiling right now. So if you remove that out of the equation, I think that you'll see the industry as a whole start to switch its focus to more a consumer-based um, product and, and efficiencies. And we're gonna be looking at, you know, cultivation practices and um, you know, like she said, different cultivars or varieties that perform in specific regions. And, we, you know, it just, it goes back to now the agronomics that, you know, every other crop is looking at, you know, rotations, nutrition, you know, planting density. And we don't have to worry about this THC because it is, it is a problem and it definitely has, you know, in, influenced the industry to just be at this stagnant growth period where we're, we're always so concerned with it. So from a processor standpoint, I think it opens the floodgates. You know, to me, it's just the first step in how we can grow. Because like we said, when we put industrial hemp back in the definition and we have industrial hemp, grain and fiber and floral hemp as, you know, the hemp that they that they think of. Well, now I can I can go to FDA and I can look at ingredients with a totally different lens. I can go to my consumer and I am and I'm talking about a nutritious food with a completely different framework, right? Because right now everything is cannabinoid focused because they don't understand that there's a difference between what I'm talking about. So I think it really is like just the first step in creating much more opportunity in these different industries that we don't have to be weighed down with this confusion. Okay, Courtney. Yeah, and I would add that I think this is that when we get this passed and this is implemented by the different states and the tribal governments and hopefully USDA in their own plan, that it will encourage farmers to want to grow grain and fiber. It will help investment into infrastructure in the manufacturing and then hopefully will just help build the overall domestic supply chain. And so, you know, we're all very focused on hemp itself, right? But we need to be thinking about these larger manufacturers for traditional products. I mean, like all the auto companies, the airline industries, these textile manufacturers, we don't really have a domestic supply chain for them. And so if I see that we get this passed, that they're the ones that are really going to be benefiting because they're going to have a new ingredient. They're going to have a new material that they can be using. And if we can increase domestic production overall, how fantastic is that going to be for our country? Amen to that. Morgan? The industry, I think we, you know, we're in it every day, right? So like, this is very, you know, this is a new concept to us. We understand like the thresholds, like the verbiage, but when you go to like, you know, a, a car dealer or, you know, an automotive industry, like they're not hemp experts. They don't take the time and they quite frankly don't want to take the time to understand all these nuances. They want you to deliver a product on a platter that they can either implement or not. And so right now we don't have that um, distinction that allows us to take the next step there. And so I think the industry needs to mature. And instead of, you know, advocating that we need to educate people on the differences of hemp, we just need to make it more, um, digestible for like the average consumer to understand. And I think that this is a critical part in that because um, it's going to be a long time if we could just keep beating our drum and telling people like to understand it because they're not in it every day. That's not their, they don't breathe this like we do. And so we have to make it as easily and palatable as possible for, you know, everyone outside of the hemp industry to accept the industry as a whole. Okay. And also I think for, from a regular consumer, regular citizen standpoint, the, the, added benefits of scaling production to a, a true commercial scale is going to be lower prices. Um, a lot of people, you know, enjoy hemp hearts and hemp protein, um, and it's still relatively expensive compared to other comparable proteins. Um, and then also the, the mitigation of climate change, you know, starting to be able to deliver on you know, more sustainable end user products, be that paper products, bioplastic products, green construction. You know, we we in the industry know the, you know, basically unlimited potential of what hemp can do um, and the environmental benefits that, that come along with that. Um, you know, and also, you know, personally speaking, I also really would like to see the scaling of hemp production, particularly for fiber and grain to be the start of a revolution for regenerative agriculture in general. 
You know, people, farmers don't have preconceived notions about how hemp should be cultivated. So if we can teach them how to do it using cover crops and no-till practices from the beginning, then maybe those farmers will then also see how that can benefit their other crops. And if we're, if we're going to look at climate change as a real thing, agriculture does have to have a relatively big shift in mindset um, in moving away. So I'm hoping that hemp can play a role in easing that transition and having farmers look at this as an opportunity as opposed to, you know, some dreaded thing that they, they feel pressured into doing because it will save them money in addition to having the environmental benefits. So, you know, that's just sort of kind of my environmental yeah, hope sure. that, that this will help bring about as well. Okay. So you mentioned finding somebody in Congress to champion this bill. Uh, how about with the USDA? Are you talking to people there? Do they understand sort of the like what's at stake here? Absolutely. So we have, I mean, we've been working on this kind of behind the scenes for almost five months now. We started talking internally. We've talked to several different departments of agriculture. We've talked with USDA about the protocol and actually how this would work on the ground. And then that's after after we had all of that buy-in, then we took it to the Senate. Okay. And so we've, we've been doing a lot of work, like I said, behind the scenes, and we're excited to start talking about this, you know, more publicly to get, you know, let folks know what we've been working on and, and the procedures that we're, we're proposing to, to, sen- to the members of the Senate and to get Senate introduction. Okay. And I think their response has been very, you know, um, very optimistic because they don't want to manage the program how it is like now. It is so cumbersome. And so like when we, you know, initially started those conversations, they're like, yes, thank you, please. Like we need help in managing this very diverse crop. And the current framework doesn't give us that, um, you know, that flexibility. And so that was encouraging from my perspective that like it wasn't like they were paused and hesitant and we had to talk them into it. It was like arms wide open. How do we make this happen? Each of you sort of mentioned the concept of like taking industrial out of hemp and then putting it back in. Can you sort of talk me through sort of like the history of the what the semantics around industrial hemp? Sure, I will. We worked on this very specifically when we were drafting the Hemp Farming Act. So in 2014 was when we actually had our very first definition federally for industrial hemp. And that's what distinguished industrial hemp from marijuana. And it was solely based on that 0.3% Delta 9 standard. After the 2014 Farm Bill passed and states started implementing their pilot programs, USDA, DEA, and FDA issued a statement of principles in 2016. And that was the agency's interpretation of what the 2014 Farm Bill did and did not do. And part of what they actually tried to do in there was change the definition to say it only applied to grain and fiber production. And of course, industry did not agree with this. Congress did not agree with this. And what it really alerted us to was that because cannabinoid production was new, you know, in concept, right? And CBD was really what was being grown under the 2014 Farm Bill. And the agencies weren't really familiar with this, that they were trying to restrict what could actually be done under the 2014 Farm Bill and not allow cannabinoid production. But Senator McConnell and several of the other senators pushed back on this very hard and said, no, like we were very clear in our intent. And in the the HIV DEA 2018 case, there was an amicus brief written by members of Congress that really laid out, you know, when we said hemp, we meant anything below that 0.3%. We meant cannabinoids. You know, we meant CBD production. And so when we were drafting the Hemp Farming Act of 2018, we looked at all of this that had happened, what had been coming out from the agencies and said, okay, well, if we're using the term industrial and the agencies are taking this to mean it can only be grain and fiber production and it it has to be industrial. It can't be cannabinoids, even though the letter of the law says it's just that 0.3% threshold. We're going to change the definition. We're going to make it really clear that you can do anything with this crop as long as it's below that THC threshold. So we took industrial, we kept the term hemp, we added in the extra language of uh, you know, cannabinoids, derivatives, extracts, isomers, you know, uh, salts of isomers, acids, things like that. Um, 
And we used some of the exact language in the marijuana definition and the language that DEA had used to really kind of signal to them, when we say hemp, we mean anything below that 0.3 threshold. Unfortunately, while that, you know, created a benefit on the cannabinoid production side, it has come to create more restrictions for grain and fiber. Hmm. And so now we're seeing that with the 2018 Farm Bill being implemented and what the USDA rules have come out and how the states and tribes and USDA themselves have, have implemented this, that we need to create this other definition for industrial hemp itself. Going back to that kind of core understanding that industrial hemp is grain and fiber, but we do also need cannabinoid hemp. It, you know, it creates incredible value. It's provided a lot of economic benefit around this country and helped thousands and thousands of people, if not millions. And so we want to make sure that that existing hemp framework is maintained under the 2018 Farm Bill, but then get this new exemption for true industrial hemp, grain and fiber. Okay. So what's happening in other countries? Like, are there other countries that have this sort of level of frustration when it comes to their um, their hemp programs? Well, I can speak, you know, Canada is a good one, an example to look for. Um, they've taken a little bit different approach. They haven't necessarily had a really strong fiber presence. They've been very focused on grain the last, you know, couple decades. And so, you know, they have a certified seed program that, you know, is very similar to our, um, uh, our risk-based analysis or our risk-based um, sampling protocol. And so they have these certified seed genetics that you know historically aren't going above the 0.3% compliance limit. Um, and they just don't sample them. And they're like only the only genetics that are allowed to grow in Canada. But a caveat to that, and what we've seen, you know, really in the last couple of years is fiber production comes online and we're looking at crops that we need to make. You know, it, the economic the farm economics don't make sense. Um, unless you're producing three tons or more an acre, you know, with the, the established commodity pricing for hemp straw. And, um, and those genetics don't necessarily perform in Canada right now. And so the Canadian, uh, you know, fiber companies are, are kind of hamstringed right now that are like the current Canadian law and how those certified seed program works. They're not able to get these high performing genetics into, um, into production at any sort of scale. And so, you know, if I was one of those companies, I'd be screaming bloody murder because just, you know, south of the border, we, we do have the opportunity to grow these varieties that, you know, may have a higher tendency to go hot. But again, it goes back to, and, and what I really hope that your listeners take home is at the end of the day, if a, if a crop is going to go hot in the middle of the season, you know, what does that matter to you? It's not harvested. It's not coming off the field. Even if someone went into your field and rolled up a blunt, right? Because that's the, like, the thing that they think everyone's going to do. It's not going to do anything. What we need to worry about is what is coming off the field. And when you grow for fiber, you're usually cutting it and then letting it stay in the field, going through a redding process where any of those trichromes that are, you know, associated with the floral material are going to be, you know, in the field, left in the field, and they're, they're going to be destroyed in the field. So why do I care if at some point during that growing season, if you took a random sample, why do I care if there's a higher level of THC, right? Let's just, let's just go back to that. I don't, I don't, I don't understand why we care. So, you know, your question of what are other countries doing? I don't, I don't know um, the international industry as well as maybe I should. I do think Canada is a great example of what could happen if you don't open those floodgates. Right. If you don't look at what the potential is, because, you know, this is a plant that is going to do what it needs to do to be productive and survive. And so um, you know, back to my comment earlier, like I want our focus, like I want breeding companies to start focusing on production. I want, you know, processors to start identifying production methods and, and growing regions where they're getting the most bang for their buck, because this is capitalism at its finest. Right. We need to compete. And if we just continue to say that, like, this is the limiting factor, then we won't be able to compete. Yeah. And I'd like to add too, like, when we look at other countries, like, it's a, a mishmash, just like, you know, you would expect it to be with some really strict and some looser. But my argument there is it doesn't matter because when it comes to the global stage, what the United States does is the standard that everybody else will follow. We are by, by far the largest producing country of anything. Um, so I don't know why we should even care what other countries do. Um, and quite frankly, the, the whole goal, you know, again, you know, like I always kind of circle back to my 
my mitigating climate change kind of thing. Um, we want to grow, create local supply chains. We don't want to be shipping tons and tons and tons of, of material across the ocean. That's not climate smart. Um, we want to start buying American. We want to start manufacturing American. We want to, um, you know, do the things that we need to do in order to, to be self-sustaining, um, not to exclude the rest of the world, but, but we need to create American jobs. We need to help American farmers and we need to worry about the environment. And, and hemp and local supply chains kind of checks all those boxes. Um, what could listeners do to help you in your cause of getting this exemption passed? You can go to hempexemption.com and sign up for our email list. We're looking for folks not only to just be supportive of our policy in general, but to provide financial contributions to keep our campaign going. We would love to have as much support as possible. Once we have our official introduction of the legislation, we'll be looking for advocates on the ground to help reach out as constituents to gain additional co-sponsorship on the bill. So we need everybody's help, not only folks within the hemp industry, but we're, you know these larger manufacturers, more traditional manufacturers and consumers who want to see the, the farmers, you know, very well respected who are producing the materials that are going into the products that they're buying every single day. I was just going to add to that, you know, Courtney said, you know, obviously we want people to be a part of our mailing list because quite frankly, when we go to these senators and we start finding, you know, partners and co-champions, like they need to hear from their constituents that this matters in their state. They may not be a farmer. They may not be a big produce, you know, agriculture producing state, but, you know, take the guy who's walking down the street who wears a hemp t-shirt and like loves the idea that he's wearing a hemp t-shirt. Well, I can bet you 90% of those hemp t-shirts came from a varietal that tested positive for THC in season. So if you care about your hemp t-shirt, then you care enough to like get this exemption so we can have, you know, that same product here in the U.S. So I definitely would encourage that like these, these senators and, and congressmen, they need to hear from their constituents that this does matter more than just the farmer because it's a full cycle supply chain that like everyone needs to be a part of. So the, the website is hempexemption.com. You can sign up there with your email and just your general information. Once we have the bill introduced, we will be launching an advocacy platform to help everyone with their outreach. So hempexemption.com. All right. Um, what else should listeners know about the exemption or that the work that you all are doing in the hemp space? I would say that we, you know, we really care about our farmers. We care about our farmers that are not only already growing hemp, but farmers that are looking for another commodity, another crop to, to use in rotation. And we, we really want farmers to not see this as a risk, but see this as a reward. And I think that's what this will do. You know, creating this exemption for grain and fiber will take, take the risk out of the equation and, and make hemp production a reward for them and therefore create benefit and value throughout the entire supply chain. Yeah, and I would add if, if someone, you know, has some concerns or they think that they have a better idea of how to manage this, like send us a note, right? We are more than willing to, to talk about these things because it's, we're trying to make an ironclad, you know, um, argument that this is the, this is the way to do it. But we know that there's like going to be holes that people are going to try to poke. And that's good. That's healthy for us to go through those iterations to like try and figure out all of the shortcomings to what we're proposing so that when we do get it into policy and, you know, we're in those fa final drafting languages and we're working with USDA of how do they implement it boots on the ground. You know, we've we've hopefully considered every possible scenario for this not to be successful. So if any of your listeners like, you know, thinking, well, that will that won't work because of X, Y, Z, send it to us. Like, let's talk about it because we, we need to know these things. You know, we're just three gals that are pretty passionate about you know, the hemp industry, but we know we haven't seen it all and we know we haven't been in every place. And so it's important that if you want to see this be successful, then let us know if you think that there's something wrong with it. I can't imagine that people would be against it, but what are the arguments against it? And maybe I won't include this part in the interview. I'm just curious. <laughs> We haven't, you know, we haven't spoken directly with law enforcement about this yet. Um, but the, the biggest argument against it that I see will be the fear that folks will grow marijuana just because we've seen that in Oregon and we've been dealing with it. We have 
we have moratorium on our licensing right now because of what's happened. But because of that it is actually how and why we've structured the enforcement and the penalty piece of this so that it is so strict and severe. So that if you, know, if you wanna grow cannabinoids, you are more than welcome. You just stay under the existing framework. But if you want to grow grain and fiber and you know that I'm only growing grain or fiber, I will only harvest this material. This is where you know, my contract is or where the market is that I'm trying to engage in. That's why you can get this exemption and have this declaration. And if someone were to you know, try to get around a background check or try to get around the testing to actually grow marijuana and make this designation, and it's found out that they've done this, they're out, they're completely out of the program. You know, and if their state wants to enforce additional civil penalties or criminal penalties, they can. But that's why it's such a strict enforcement program because we really wanna create this very solid benefit for the farmer and not allow any bad actors to circumvent this. Yeah, and at the same time, there's, no, we, we want to make sure that there are no unintended consequences on the cannabinoid side as well. Like none yeah. of this is in any way to make life more difficult for them. Um, it is strictly to treat industrial hemp more like a true commodity crop. And the type of farmers that are going to be interested in doing this at scale are a different level of you know, there, there isn't going to be hemp farmers. There's going to be farmers that have hemp as part of their rotation. And the normalization of that is what we're really after here. Um, and, and it really is that simple. It is an, such an honor to be speaking with the three most what, knowledgeable, powerful women of hemp people of hemp. I, I don't know how you bill yourselves, but I really appreciate what you do in this space. And, um, I'm sure our listeners do too. So thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. We appreciate what you do, Eric. Thank you so much for letting us share. All right, there you go. There it is, the hemp exemption. So if you want to get behind this hemp exemption or learn more about it, just go to hempexemption.com. I'll put that link on the show page for this episode at lancasterfarming.com. All right, so that does it for me today. Thank you for listening to our show. My name is Eric Herlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. And hey, I mentioned last week that we are working on a special hemp section of the newspaper that gets published this week. It's going to hit the newsstands April 23rd. That's this Saturday's newspaper, so be sure to pick it up. Uh, it's like a, a special section in the newspaper. You'll see it. There's lots of great stories. There's lots of, uh, you know, different voices from various aspects of the hemp industry. And uh, this will also be available at the Pennsylvania Hemp Summit next week in Lancaster. And we'll have copies with us in Michigan for the Midwest Hemp Expo happening in May. Remember, you can always reach out to me. You can send an email to podcast at LancasterFarming.com. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Do you have ideas for our show? Do you have story ideas, people I should talk to, ideas you want to just discuss, you want to tell me about your hemp operation, you want to suggest a new name for our podcast or whatever, please get in touch with me. I love hearing from you. So anyway, until next time, I will see you in the newspaper. Season 2 Episode 17 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2022 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. The show was written, recorded, edited, and produced by Eric Herlock. The music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tim, Bird, Shadow, 